we uh <laughs> I always have to figure out how to present these things. I never do this anymore. <laughs> Hi, I'm Carlotta. Uh, is my video even on? Boy, I'm very unprepared. You're right you're on and it sounds good. And on your top right, there's a share and just to the left of it's present. Fantastic. No, not share, the present okay. one. Present. Ah, present. There we go. All right. Show me the money. Getting business buy-in to secure your organization. Um, I uh, want to take a moment to say, oh, who I am, I'm Carlotta Sage. I've worked in a lot of very large companies, Netgear, Netflix, Facebook, and most recently, several years ago, FireEye. I took a six week contract at FireEye in 2013 when they were 300 people and four and a half years later, I was like, wow, that was a wild ride. The company is great, but I really love the industry. So big shout out to my Draper Utah guys at FireEye. Um, I miss you, but uh, I'm happy to be here with you today. Uh, you can reach me on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, and, and I wanted to thank Chris. I think the, the talk that he gave is really important. And you, I do wanna touch real quick on a question that somebody had asked is, if you're later in your career, you know, taking the pay cuts brutal. And, and I agree, um, there was a point at FireEye where I had to decide if I wanted to move to the Intel team and take a 35% pay cut, or if I wanted to move out of the company. And um, I ended up moving out of the company. I still took a pay cut because I started my own company, but um, it, I don't regret it at all. So I know it's hard to take that pay cut, um, but your other option is to find a role that is, if you're, for example, a program manager, an ops manager at a large company, that makes you very qualified to be a CIO at a small company. So that may be another route that you want to look at is taking that CIO role and growing the security team and becoming a CISO that way. So I have actually become a virtual CISO doing that. Uh, originally, when I started my company, I was consulting into security groups and security uh, startups doing what's called knowledge strategy. And that's basically, um, uh, where tech process, business process, and people meet. That's kind of my special squishy area. So that's what this talk is going to be about. If you are in a small org, I hope to give you some really good uh, info for, for growing security in your organization. Um, if you are in a larger org or at a vendor, uh, the, the worksheets that I give you at the end should still help you facilitate conversations, which is really, very helpful. So a quick moment to say thank you. Thank you, Besides Salt Lake City. I'm glad to be here. And thank you to all of the sponsors. Um, and, and to turn it around and make it a virtual con conference so quickly. Very impressed. So thank you for the uh, Conord uh, team as well. But to give you context around this whole thing that I'm talking about, you know, we in security and, and having worked for a vendor, I know this is true, we mostly hear from vendors and those really big organizations that they're selling to. So I want to give you the context of that black line. That's, you know, that's who we're hearing from. And we need to hear from them because they have a greater need. They have more money. They can drive innovation. They can drive conversations. But the majority of us live in this green area. You know, in the United States alone, 99.7% of businesses are less than 500 employees. Um, the orgs that I've been working with have usually been less than 100 employees. Uh, and some of those uh, companies need more security than others. You know, some of those uh, companies can just get Google Mail or O365 and that's gonna cover the majority of their needs, right? Um, but there's a lot of businesses in there that need more and we need to be having more conversations around that. So if you are in that smaller space and you're having trouble, you're, you're the IT person, you're having trouble really getting people to buy into security, what I really need you to understand is that this is not about you and it's not about the technology because you are the security expert in that smaller org. Um, and it's a little bit of like black magic for those folks that you're trying to get on board with security concepts. They're like, okay, you're kind of like Chicken Little running around, you know, saying the sky's falling down and you're starting, you know, the fear is putting them off, the pressure, uh, some of that negativity is putting them off. Um, so what I need you to really practice, I need you to practice, well, sorry, um, what I need you to understand is that the data you're securing 
is not just about the technology that you are driving or using. Every business process, every person in your org have their fingers in that data in some way, and you have to think systematically, right? You have to think of the whole big picture. Um, so with that, you need to start practicing your social engineering, right? There's, if you know more about Mandiant's APT29 and you're in a small org, then you know about your executives and your internal customers. I'm going to ask you to reassess your priorities. Either you need to really start looking for a, a vendor to work for, or a very large organization to work for, or you need to commit to being that security architect, that security generalist, that eventual CISO, and you need to really start working on your soft skills. And I know that is never anything anyone in tech wants to hear, but it makes your role and getting security buy-in so much easier. So all of those, you know, OSN things that you hear about and that you see conferences on, all of those things can be applied internally. Right? You have to meet your internal audience where they are. Your executives, you know, their personal life, they've got the home, the spouse, the pets, the hobbies, maybe they have a yacht, right? Um, and, and they care about that. And in the business life, they care about risk and operational costs. And there are other things that they care about, but you need to figure out what those are. And risk is anything that puts pressure on a business, right? Uh, right now, Coronavirus, nobody, this has F all to do with technology. It has all, nothing to do with business, but it, the impact that we're feeling from it, it, that was a huge risk. And I personally know CIOs, CISOs, who have in their business continuity plans, they have plans for pandemics. They have plans for uh, zombie apocalypse. Like what do we do if people physically cannot get into work? What do we do, do if there is civil unrest in one of our global centers? You know, um, when I worked, I believe, at Netgear, there was a major issue and a major unrest in Egypt. And literally, we opened the call center for that crew to come in and shelter in place there because it was so dicey where they were. You have to consider all of those pieces. You can't just look at the technology. Um, and this is where if this is the route that you want to go and a lot of people and chris um previously just also talked about it some people care about search some people don't if you're looking at this more general security architect or CISO eventually role uh, the CISP actually is very good because it gives you really good insight into business continuity disaster recovery that kind of thing if you are a hundred percent technical and you want to be a, a CISO one day, you really need to start looking at that. And even if you don't get the cert, the pieces that they cover on the business side are going to be critical for you to understand and be successful. But mostly those soft skills that nobody ever wants to talk about and nobody, you know, if, if you're putting soft skills off as a, oh, you know, I can have somebody else do that. Um, you're frankly, you're doing it wrong because getting people invested in your success as an IT or security person is going to be critical for making your job a lot easier, easier especially in a smaller org. You know, so for those internal customers, they're looking to optimize their work. They want to put as little, and all of us do this, right? We want to put as little effort in and get the most effort out that we can. Um, and that means that any friction that we introduce to their business process or to their work life becomes an obstacle. So this is where really understanding the business processes becomes important. Sit down, you know, with your, or virtually at this point, right, with your internal customers and say, walk me through your typical day. Show me the systems that you use. And then really think about how what you are going asking them to do from a security perspective, think about how that impacts them because they are not security experts. They will probably never be security experts. There will probably be one or two people who really love what you do and are really curious and become, you know, you become their inspiration. Um, but the majority of them are very happy doing what they're doing, I hope. Uh, and they're not going to they're just not gonna ever be that bought in 
you have to make it personal in a lot of ways. You have to make sure that they feel like they're heard. And even if they're heard and you still have to do it this way anyhow, and here's why, that at least gives them context. They feel like they've had a say. Uh, one of those pieces that, that I love to do is, okay, I know multi-factor and VPN is a real pain in the butt, but it's really important. Here's why. Here are the statistics on this. And I know it doesn't matter to you personally, but it makes our company and our customers a lot more secure. Um, on that side, recognition works better than shaming. Uh, take on a Friday, hit your Slack channel and say, hey, thanks to these three people this week, that made my life a little bit easier, right? That gets you visibility. People understand that you're really trying to connect to them and they respond better to that. And then, you know, success. How do you become a part of their success? How do they become a part of yours? It's a, it's a psychology thing. It's a social engineering thing. It's a piece that you really need to start looking at. It just smooths a lot of things over. So, but going back to those, those risk and those operational costs, what the business knows is coming and what they can plan for is a very different thing. You, as a security person, have a much bigger per picture of what's going on in the landscape. And you have to distill that in a way that you can warn your, your exec board or your exec team uh, what's coming down the pipe or what's being seen. And it's gotta be sound bite. Like you, you, Twitter is great because if you learn to write uh, a concept in two or three tweets, that is fantastic for learning to deal with executives because they don't have a lot of time to dive into details. You need to have those details prepared if they ask for it. But at the same time, that's what they really want is that bottom line. How does this impact us? What are you talking about? Why is this important? Uh, you need to figure out where they are as your leadership and how you can make what you need them to agree to the easiest and simplest and least fearful thing. Operating on fear doesn't work. It, it does sometimes, but it, it doesn't always because after a while you really do sound like chicken little. Um, those are the two big pieces, I think, on your exec team and your internal customers. If you have, um, people are going to say when you talk about security, but we use Google, we use Microsoft, you know, we use, uh, we use Azure, we use AWS, and they're secure, so that means we're secure. And the simplest way I have found to tell people, no, that's, you're thinking of this wrong, uh, is to say, yes, they are secure, and they're a part of our tool set, but our security is about securing our relationship with the customer. We don't want Google, we don't want AWS, we don't micro want Microsoft to own our customer relationship because they'll put us out of business. And when you say it like that, your execs suddenly understand, okay, now they're thinking about technology as a tool in their set rather than as a solution for security itself. So if you have any questions, if you are running into very common pushback, um, people don't want VPN, people don't want multi-factor authentication, you know, feel free to toss that in the questions and we'll address and get some verbiage for you for that. But um, really, when it comes down to it, it is about the money. And money for business execs talks. Um, if you're in a very small org, your margins tend to be very thin. So I'm going to share and walk you through two worksheets that will help you frame those conversations. I'm going to preface this by saying, when you're putting together worksheets and talking about numbers, uh, there are people who are gonna push back on that. They're gonna say, oh, these numbers aren't real, blah, 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 blah. That's fine. If they disagree with it, give them the worksheet and tell them, you tell me which numbers are correct. Uh, really, it's about starting that conversation and getting that moving. So I'm gonna walk you through two things. And um, if I can, let's see if I can, yep. I'm gonna toss these links. 
into the chat. So in the Zoom chat, you know I have a couple of the links. Um, one of them should be, oops, <laughs> my Zoom is all out of the, out of the, okay. One of them should be a simple knowledge strategy, ROI. And what this does, and I've done this two ways in here. Um, one of the things that your operations team is concerned about is what they're paying people and what they're getting for that money. And any time that you can say, we can make people more efficient and free them up, especially if people are really fighting for headcount. We, if we buy this service or do this project, here is how we make people more efficient and therefore actually save the company money. We, we get that investment back. So you can say anything from uh, if your IT group is having to provision a lot of laptops because you keep getting owned, and here's how much money software to solve that you know, is going to cost us. Here's how much we're spending in terms of labor. This gives you a chance to actually start that conversation in a place where um, your operations team actually will listen because now you're actually talking about money. Um, when it comes to larger organizations, especially supporter IT groups, where you have kind of a tiered level of here's what we pay at the lower level, here's what we pay level two, here's what we pay level three people, you can get more complicated uh, with this tiered efficiency piece. And it will, again, how these pieces affect your team as a whole are really great. You can also do this if you're in a support or an IT help desk role. You can do that ROI by case deflection, which I have found to be very effective. <laughs> um, the bigger your group is, the better this scales. Uh, it, and it just helps make sure that people understand there is a price to productivity here, and we can quantify that. And we can quantify that in ways that are meaningful to you. That way it can either be by case or by actual like hourly labor. And the other piece that I've put together, um, oops, sorry, Jason, thank you. I'm gonna put those links in again. Uh, apparently I was only sending them to the panelists. So the other piece I've put together, and this is a piece that takes a little bit longer to go through, is a risk and recovery estimate. And this I've divided up into four separate pieces, four separate um, sections. The first one is infrastructure. If all you're doing is securing an infrastructure, here is how you estimate productivity loss, you know, incident response, and recovery. And recovery costs are going to include anything that is not already planned in your operational budget. So if you have to go out and hire Mandiant to come in and do an incident response, that wasn't planned, here it goes, it goes into your recovery costs. So if you've ever wondered where those numbers have come from, where people were like, well, we think this incident has cost this company this, they're probably working off of something very similar to this. I know Adrian uh, Sanabria has put out a simple incident calculator, which I've linked to in the helpful sources tab on this uh, sheet as well. And I tried to go through and actually give context. And that's really important when you're talking to your teams, giving context of why we're, we're setting this up. And all of this is just example numbers. Uh, actually, they're, they're example numbers from, a, from one of the clients in the VC so forth. So they're real numbers, um, but they're replaceable. Anything in green, you can put that, you can plug that in, your, your yellow and red numbers will calculate. So in terms of securing your infrastructure, this can give them, you know, okay, I'm not too worried about losing $3,000 in productivity. I'm not too worried about losing, you know, $3,000 on an incident response. Um, you know, this probably somebody has clicked a, a fish link. Um, but when you start looking at recovery costs, then those can really add up. I know that one of my clients actually had to completely migrate out of a platform in probably about two weeks because they had a website defacement. And that costs them not just the loss of, of credibility, and there's a lot of intangibles that I talk about in these contexts, right? Protectivity loss, um, uh, 
being kind of intangible, but when we get to service delivery and application, you start getting a lot more credibility, brand, you know, reputation hits that you can't quantify as easily. You can quantify them if you're losing money. Uh, that's a lot easier to quantify, <laughs> but until you actually lose that money, um, it's a best guess, right? So, so that's for securing your infrastructure. Your service delivery, and again, these are actual numbers from uh, an unnamed client on or very similar uh, rounded numbers from an unnamed client, where this is how much they lose per day if they have a denial of service or some, some sort of interruption to their service. And that's not, again, this is just the money that we're losing in terms of the service we should be delivering. If they have a service level agreement that says, after three hours, you start paying us then you have to add that money in. Right? <laughs> that becomes extra cost to the business. Um, and again, your support impact cases, um, I'm gonna actually change this to say help desk or, well, I'm not gonna do it right now. Uh, but it's basically your help desk and your support impact. Um, you can, for example, if your support team usually gets 500 uh, tickets in a month and suddenly they get 500 tickets in a week, then you can say, you can actually put a number to that impact of that incident. Uh, it's really great when you can do that because it, it makes your board pay attention. And again, those incident respond co response costs. Uh, in terms of brand loss, you know, there's all kinds of, of studies out there. You can, of course, there have been huge retail shops hit, um, Target, Home Depot, all of those kinds of things. They're big enough that they've recovered because they can spend that money on marketing <laughs> to, to keep that brand going. So they're, you're gonna see a big dip for, for them and their value, but they're gonna be able to turn that around because they've got the money to do that. Smaller shops, probably not as easily. Uh, there are, uh, I think there was a recent example in my helpful resources that I've linked to of a smaller company of less than 300 people that ransomware took them out. They just, they couldn't recover. They did not have good business continuity. They did not have good disaster recovery. Getting the basics of IT correct get you a lot in security, they really do. I can't stress that enough. If you can get the basics down, make sure your backups are working, make sure your business continuity is actually comprehensive and understandable, comprehensible, right? Uh, that becomes very important. And on application risk estimates, I'm still trying to come up with context for that, but it, it's a little more straightforward because you need to confirm the vulnerability that someone has reported to you. You have to develop or redevelop around it, and then you have to test it. So those costs can be a little more easy. Again, for a very big company, there are, there's a, there are small shops that are developing, but a lot of this is really geared more towards a larger company with a very large, um, very complex system. You can still use it for a smaller shop. It's just your impact's gonna be smaller. But at the same time, you at least know what that impact is. Uh, I keep a running, I've started keeping a running log of malware ransom demand estimates and business email compromise estimates. And I give my sources on who they are and I try to give a lot of context. Again, you should be able to hand this sheet to a finance person and they can read through the context and then they can come back to you and they can say, this makes sense, this doesn't. And at least again, facilitating that conversation, trying to meet your, your team where they are and make security accessible and less black magic to them. Uh, if you really want to get your finance person on board, you can tell them that SOC 2 compliance, one of the industry, the industry standard, was developed by the American Association of CPAs. Right? It's the finance guys that were driving that security standard. So. Ideally, if you're having a lot of trouble, talk to your finance, to your head finance person and say, how do I make this meaningful to you and your team? And, and if you bring this worksheet to them, 
you're going to at least have a conversation. And hopefully that conversation will be productive for you. Some of that may be, you know, it's a lot cheaper to send a couple of our people to conferences and maybe an extra training or pay for a cert to help us out than paying ransomware. And of course, we never recommend paying the ransomware because less than half the time it actually works. There's also what I like about Secure World and, and the FBI is they've started putting together those pieces of, uh, sure, this is what they're asking for, and whether or not that works, you're still having to pay for recovery. Because once they've compromised your system, now you have to bring somebody in, figure it out, undo the damage, lock it down. So there are costs associated. Uh, that 5,000 may not look like it's very big, but there's a much bigger cost behind it. And part of this is just to make people aware of that. So with that, my last tab here, it, or actually they're helpful resources. Um, these are places where you can get shared decryp decryption keys from the No More Ransomware Project. There's um, FBI field offices. If you are hit by malware, even if you pay it and it goes away, that's great. You'd be very lucky if that's true. Still encourage you to report that to the FBI because that makes their numbers more meaningful. They're the best thing we have right now for looking at the country as a whole in terms of security and how the impact, you know, impact on business, on American businesses. So um, their Internet Crime Complaint Center could use some updating. Um, but I think Adrian Snobria, again, big shout out, thank you, has begun keeping a spreadsheet of businesses that have reported themselves closed has a consequence of breach. So those are great. There's other cost calculators out there. I, I really like uh, the sample data breach cost calculator because it actually asks you a series of questions. I don't know, I don't have insight to the assumptions they're making or how accurate their calculation is, but just kind of looking at what the FBI puts out versus what they're calculating, it seems to be pretty reasonable. I don't see it to be, I don't see it as being really outscaled. Um, and then an incident cost calculator, again, from Adrian Sinabria, that's, that's a much more, that's looking at the incident rather than the impact across an organization. And then in terms of how do I get security, or at least started, get my, my, my start with security tools when I can't buy anything. Uh, great, there are some fantastic resources out there. Um, Security Onion is a big one. I did not realize that that was created by some of the ex Mandian folks that I used to work with. I ran into them at B-Sides Augusta last year and got to say hi to them. And uh, I had worked with them primarily virtually. So it was really nice to get to meet them and realize they were behind this really fantastic open source software. Mandiant had a, a very big ethos around sharing their tools and FireEye has fortunately kept some of those tools. If you go to FireEye's um, website, you can find, and I'll, I'll update the links in here, you can find a uh, red line and some uh, and analyst tools, triage tools, mapping tools. There's some really great ones there. I know Know Before has some fantastic open source tools as well. If you know of a vendor or you work with a vendor or you are a vendor who does some open source tools for folks, would love to hear from you. I'd love to add you to the list. I know the Security Onion folks um, have a conference every year. I've put their 2019 conference videos in. Watch them if you're in a small shop. This is a really fantastic way to get started on network monitoring. So that's, that's what I have right now. Um, let me switch to Q&A. And Kingbird has asked, it seems like small businesses lately are really caught in an unfair situation. Most don't have the funds for the more expensive effective solutions, nor the funds to cover an incident like breaches and ransomware attacks. What low cost options exist? That's a really great question, Kingbird. I hope the Security Onion piece has given you a start. Um, there are a lot more out there. Um, I personally have the most experience with Security Onion and with the Mandiant uh, slash FireEye Redline product. Um, has I here, I know that some of the, one of the um, 
really fantastic security guy, Paul Melson at Target, um, has put out, uh, he's got a, a scraper for Pastebin that had some really interesting information that um, it's free. He just puts it out there on Twitter. It's free. There's a lot of free content on Twitter. Um, there's a lot of open source software out there. I think Security Onion so far to me has been the most comprehensive. Uh, and part of the ethos that that team went into it with was exactly this. We're protecting the wrong people. Like the big guys can afford that protection and the small businesses are having a, are really struggling with that. I think we're going to see a shift in the market as well. Um, because, you know, there's a thousand Fortune 1000 companies, there's 5.6 million small businesses. Now, even if only 10% of that 5.6 million can afford anything, that's still a much bigger market than your, your Fortune 500. So I would like to see, and I believe I'm already starting to see, that shift towards addressing, addressing the down market, the mid market, and eventually the smaller market. I think Google's tools, for example, um, have done a really good job. Like nobody, you don't even think about it anymore. If, you're, if you've got a friend who's an artist or starting a website or something, it's like, hey, you know, for six bucks a month, you can have a Google business account that gives your email and drive and all of these other things. So does that, does that answer your question, Kingbird? Okay. Any other questions? I know we're right up on the line. Great. Thanks, Kingbird. That was a really great question. And again, I encourage you, um, hit me up on Twitter. If you find a tool, if you have an open source tool that you're using in a smaller org, I would love to hear about it and hear about your experience. Walk me through it. I'm not going to put every link on this page. I'm going to put links that I have laid eyes on or laid hands on, um, and we'll go from there. So thanks, guys and gals. Thanks, folks. <laughs>